Can I have uh, Thanks. You will need this. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Daniel. So it feels great here, actually. You should try it at the, at the uh, session break. Um, I was hired by the government of Estonia last uh, autumn to do one uh, work which involved um, basically rethinking how we talk about Estonia's e-government and uh, digital society. There has been uh, many things going on uh, on that front, but we, we still feel that uh, somehow how we communicate about it, uh, it, uh, it needs a kind of a refresh. So during the last uh, months, I was preparing uh, this concept, and this actually included also going around in different parts of the world and meeting different people. Uh, I met uh, 11 thinkers around the world, uh, venture capitalists, uh, uh, had a Skype call with a science fiction writer, I had some activists, uh, I was talking to Kari Kasparov, the chess player, and my main goal was to uh, understand these things that we are talking about in Estonia, are these actually resonating with uh, other people in the a, in a world? And uh, uh, as a result of that, uh, our team came up with a concept that would uh, actually then guide Estonia's, uh, well, it seems that it's not my presentation, <laughs> but uh, yes, that's the, that's the uh, head of my, headline of my presentation. That, uh, uh, so we came to this uh, report that gives guidelines for Estonia's uh, next, I don't know, five, ten years of uh, uh, communication about our digital society. So it seems we need to go backwards. Okay, so, but let's start with um, what are actually efficient messages, and uh, if I have this kind of 20 minutes uh, presentation, <clears throat> then I should say that uh, in the most basic form, any campaign or any efficient messaging uh, uh, should uh, have something of this kind of uh, uh, basic uh, ideas behind them. Uh, <clears throat> for a message to be successful, it has to have some kind of differentiation, it has to be a little bit unique. Of course, it's difficult to achieve nowadays, but uh, somehow it has to be unique to some extent. It has to be as simple as possible, and uh, it needs to be repeated. Uh, so if we take, for example, Scandinavian countries, uh, someone has once written that uh, they would uh, basically have just one message, which is translated into very different uh, ideas, and the message is that there is always a better way to do things. And then you add snow, basically, and then you repeat this for 70 years. So if you, if you want to have this essence of Scandinavianness or this kind of Nordicness, then, then you look back into this, uh, how Scandinavian countries, of course different countries, and also if you take Nordic countries, like also add Finland, and it's all, all different, but uh, for a long time, there has been this kind of uh, uh, communication that is subtly similar. And uh, it, it didn't happen just like that. In the end of the 40s, these countries uh, started consciously thinking about their reputation. And they start consciously improving this kind of uh, uh, information flow through design, through literature, through culture, and of course it's not like hierarchical, but it is embedded into their, somehow, into their uh, identity. And uh, now we have this kind of understanding of Scandinavian values, of Scandinavianness, and uh, my message here is it takes a lot of time. And when I'm looking at um, some countries that are just changing the system in every three, four, five years, seeing that this campaign didn't work or that campaign didn't work, uh, then we basically can't know if these campaigns did work because it actually really takes time. It's better to have a little bit worse of idea but have it like for 20 years than to change ideas every 
every two or three years. So Estonia's story is that in the 90s, when we became newly independent, like second time, then we didn't have anything. Differently from some bigger countries, we even didn't have a market because we are so small. Our market is also small. So we didn't have money, no natural resources, no big market. And uh, somehow we uh, started to experiment a lot with information technology, and we did it uh, really boldly uh, because we didn't have money. So we did the very cheap, efficient uh, things, and um, uh, it was uh, necessity-driven. It wasn't like uh, this kind of idea that we should do this uh, because of identity or anything. But um, as we started doing this, uh, this became noticed. And uh, this became noticed by the other countries, but it also became noticed by us ourselves. Because uh, somehow this kind of experimenting gave us this kind of future-looking focus. We started to talk about future, whereas before we had a lot of this kind of wounds to talk about, this kind of historic uh, injustice and uh, things like that, that you should always talk about. But suddenly we had a counterbalance. We had this new technology, we are doing these things, and this is the future we are talking about. And when I'm looking, for example, at other Baltic countries, when I think here is a small difference that Estonia somehow started to gain this kind of future momentum from this. Uh, we, we started to gather around the idea that the information technology is somehow really important to us. So we started to digitize everything that we could. Basically, uh, many of these things are happening around the world nowadays as well, but um, we were first in some things like, I don't know, paperless uh, cabinet operations, uh, uh, mobile payments, uh, and maybe one of the most important things is that uh, today uh, uh, more than 30% of people actually vote on uh, official elections online. And uh, this is not happening anywhere else. Countries are afraid of it, uh, and they should be. We're also a little bit afraid of it. But at the same time, we are seeing that this kind of digital um, future in the digital future, this will happen anyway. And as we, we feel this idea that IT is so much in our identity, we are willing to risk with this. It is basically, if you take like United States put a man on a moon, and everything could go wrong with this. And we are doing this digital voting, and we know things can go wrong with this, but this is the future. And so we do it. Uh, from uh, some other uh, maybe interesting things is the last one that um, Estonia launched the first e-residency, which means that um, people uh, who become e-residents can actually gain access to many of these services from the world. And now you take Estonia, which is like one million people, and now we want to have uh, 10 million e-residents in 10 years. It's a vision, probably we won't get it, but you can see the idea behind it. It is the idea of actually uh, getting a bigger market and uh, also uh, scaling our own services for a world so that people could use it. So this digitization of uh, anything, uh, this, um, this has led to some uh, funny quotes. Uh, last year when Barack Obama was in Estonia, you know, this Obamacare website, this didn't really work and it was really expensive. So he came to Estonia and said that uh, I should have called Estonians when we were setting up our healthcare website. And this was basically like uh, 20 years we've been doing this kind of IT improvement and suddenly someone notices it and the Estonians were of course very happy about it. But um, uh, also, uh, <laughs> When we, when we talk about um, e-residency, then you can see this kind of quite bizarre news sometimes that um, the uh, Japanese prime minister becomes Estonian e-residents, uh, a resident. Uh, what, what is that? If you start thinking about it, it sounds really strange and, and, and uh, brings different ideas. 
but uh, in a way it's also true. Uh, he was presented with uh, Estonian IT card and he can access uh, some of our services if he wants to. It's not very fast. Oh, yeah. You see this kind of modernist uh, image um, of uh, uh, Estonian guy with, uh, with IT. It's, it's uh, nothing unheard of, of course, nowadays. Uh, people uh, with laptops, uh, it's, it's uh, something of, um, of a routine. But uh, the next picture tells the boldness or the idea behind it. Uh, that uh, it sometimes can even uh, become a little bit funny. <laughs> uh, this is the family of the president uh, five, six years ago. And uh, this uh, kind of obsession or love story with anything IT, uh, without even a lot of criticism, uh, is, uh, is part of a story. And uh, that's why we actually uh, also uh, uh, came to criticism in our report. We, uh, we understood that the way Estonia sometimes looks at IT is mythological. We are making it uh, too... Uh, we're making the story too good sometimes. And uh, we named this kind of thinking Inarnia scenario. Inarnia is in uh, this kind of fairy tale. Uh, you, you will have this kind of... Uh, tendency to over mythologize technology and then talk inspirationally everywhere, look what we did and then things like that. And, and it also in a negative sense, this kind of mythology is uh, well uh, explained in, in this uh, quote by uh, one of our po politicians after uh, cyber attacks were uh, uh, happening at, this in, at Estonian systems at 2007. She said that when I look at nuclear explosion, and the explosion or cyber attacks that happened in our country in May, I see the same thing. Really? I mean, it's not the same thing, but we are like having this kind of huge metaphors around IT. Uh, also, uh, the problem with IT, you know the main problem with IT? Is that it's always broken. As today's conference tells us, I mean, I can't even use a simple uh, handset to uh, switch the slides. There were slides without photos. I mean, this is so simple function. Why doesn't it work, really? It's because your phones, your iPads, everything is a little bit broken, always. And how can you build an identity of a country on something that is always a little bit broken? And I mean by this brokenness, I mean also this that, um, that uh, you need updates every week. How many up updates on your Android phone this week? 11, I guess. <laughs> or maybe more if you didn't update this last, last time. So the problem is that also Estonian systems, we have 600 digital services for our people you can use. But actually not everything works. And uh, I, I don't know how many don't work, but probably maybe 50 of them are in some limbo at the moment. And, uh, in order to keep them current, you really need to make a really big effort. And so, basically, if you want to have your identity around information technology, you have to take this into account. Also, uh, we have, we're having e-residency, and uh, this somehow implicates the future. Probably there will be many countries that would have e-residencies in the future. It would mean that uh, people would actually use information technology to change the location of their life. And uh, in that way, the first functioning e-residency in the world is ISIS. Because ISIS um, uh, somehow hires people through online channels a lot, and these people, according to their values, travel to different parts of the well, not different, the same part of the world. So, uh, basically, values really matter in, in traveling around and setting your next place where to be. And uh, can Estonia have like, any digital service really going, or should it actually have values built into uh, services? Because we do not share the same values with ISIS. So, it means actually our services need to reflect our values, 
and when can our communication too reflect our values. And we came up with a strategy which uh, in a very short uh, uh, way is called the Pathfinder strategy for Estonian uh, digital uh, reputation. Um, it means that we can't be pathfinders in a world. We can't put the man on the moon on every aspect of information technology. So we chose like three aspects of information technology where Estonia can actually become an avant-garde of the world. And these are uh, e-government, digital society, also including uh, digital uh, democracy, and cybersecurity. So these are the, the fields where we really want to be present everywhere. And uh, where our small, like 1.4 million uh, people country uh, should be like the world's number one. At the same time, by doing, while doing this, we need to follow the Nordic values. And uh, by Nordic values, I don't mean snow, which is OK. But uh, I mean responsibility, openness, uh, inclusion, egalitarianism, all these kind of things uh, that actually need to be built also into our digital society so that we could talk about it. These 11 people I was talking about uh, around the world, uh, and I was talking to them, uh, from them I, I gathered one really important insight, and that was if you take technology that is uh, built in Finland, it is immediately rather trustworthy, as opposed to technology that is built in Russia, Iran, or even sometimes US. So you can see that values and also this kind of connection to a place and culture where things are built, it actually matters. Uh, it also means that Estonian systems basically need to be open by design. And you see, I'm talking a lot about the real thing, the real, I don't know, public procurements not PR or communication. I mean, it's impossible to do it without these kind of things. And uh, open by design means also that um, from a moment uh, a new system is built in Estonia, for example, you need to know your, what you can do about your privacy. For example, in Estonia there is a rule that you should see if someone checks your private data. You should see it, that it was checked. We are not 100% doing it, but at the same time this is a principle that we are doing with some services and it needs to be done. And as I said, that um, information technology is always broken. There is only way to one way to deal with this. You need to admit mistakes. And that's what the big corporations also are doing. You take Amazon or Apple or Google, and there is something going wrong, we actually go and say, yes, there was this thing that went wrong and we learned from this, that, that and that. But this kind of thinking is not very natural for governments, mind you. Governments don't like to admit mistakes. And that's a tricky part, how to uh, teach the public servants, the politicians, uh, to talk about information technology in a way when you can actually admit that this thing didn't work, there was an error, and what was done about it. But if we do it right, I guess we are uh, living up to our promise. And also the other thing is that uh, with uh, any kind of services like this, uh, the same e-residency or, or whatever, uh, politician or political mind would like to have a big opening for a service, cut the ribbon and say that here is a thing that we present now to you, our people, this is like a big thing. But normally with information technology this kind of thinking doesn't work. And that's the reason why you have beta periods where you have test users and you have all these kind of things. And so this is another thing that in our report also we stressed that by bringing in new digital services, be it related to e-democracy or whatever, uh, we need to have um, uh, beta periods when we actually ask people to test it and then and, and come. And this is, again, not very natural for governments. Uh, if we are successful, with, I don't know, engaging 10 million people around the world into uh, Estonian e-residency, we would have a community that is much larger than Estonia itself. So the question would be, what would we do with this community? Would we be responsible to this community? How would that all work out? And if we take this into account, that uh, at the moment there is like this great information warfare going on between like Russia and the West, so to say, then what would all this mean that countries having e-residences, countries having this kind of more than uh, 
more than fans, having some people who are actually engaging with countries on a different level. What if we had 140 million e-residents? What, what would Estonia be then? These are such questions that would actually be questions of the reputation of the future for a country. How would you engage on that level with people who would like to engage you based upon the values? So that's a very short, uh, short uh, introduction to Estonia's digital communication strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe uh, you've got a question. I'm sure you have a question. Uh, yeah, please. We, we, we've got some time, so... And I'm... I see two, like you first, maybe. Okay, May, maybe for the, for the online viewers, we should share a microphone. Uh, is there a microphone? This one, yeah. Because some people are watching uh, this conference online, so they, they would... Not... Oops. That's before hearing the question. I, I, Good morning. I, Good morning. Okay, go on. Go. I'm also from the government institution here in Latvia, so I couldn't resist to ask a question. And actually, if I can, maybe a little bit bridge uh, what was said in the earlier by the earlier speakers, uh, and from what you told, uh, I don't know if we can compare a country to an enterprise, but uh, I wanted to address the point that was raised before uh, about the inside. Uh, work with, with your people, working with your own people, and then putting a branding outside. Uh, mm -hmm, so those mm -hmm. two aspects, and uh, here I have a... I'm interested to hear your opinion. How do you see that about uh, branding East society and digital topics inside in Estonia? How your people feel about mm -hmm. that? Uh, you spoke about um, discussing how that resonates abroad. You talk to mm -hmm. the 11 leaders or people around mm -hmm. the world, how they see that. And why I'm asking is probably because I'm Latvian and coming from here, um, we tend quite often to uh, judge ourselves from outside. Uh, if, if New York Times writes yeah, a good article yeah. about Latvia, we are all agree, and if we have a, a bad article, we immediately t criticize ourselves, sometimes not even looking if that article was true. I, I remember that your president has addressed this topic a long time ago, saying that Estonians have a similar approach. So I, I a little bit would like to hear maybe your, your uh, judgment or your feeling mm -hmm. about how your own society feels about e-residents, mm -hmm. uh, all the e-Estonia e aspect, uh, and um, okay. how does it work together? Uh, well, I can't speak, speak for a whole society, but what I can see is that um, uh, it's quite widespread, this understanding that uh, this digital has brought uh, us new identity. There are, in general, people m might not like everything with digital. It means uh, a lot of changes. But at the same time, you can see that uh, people take pride in the fact that we're sort of advanced in this. So I think uh, this is part of our national identity at the moment. It doesn't maybe apply to every single person, but if you just had a research, you would see that it has an important part. And so here, hence the mythology also. It, it comes from many people. It's not only tech people, it's, it's about all of that. But the, the other part of the question that, uh, uh, about the inside and, and, and so on, while doing this uh, research myself, I was also uh, analyzing all the documents we had and also meeting with a lot of people. And I would see that at this time and age, there, there is a lot of um, worries around in the Baltics, basically. And, um, and you can see that uh, exactly there are like uh, information war is coming with Russia, a lot of different uh, types of information. And then you suddenly have this, you have this e-residency to work with, which is engaging directly with people from around the world. People feel actually liberated. They, if we talk about public servants or politicians, they want to join in because this is something entirely different where you can actually create value every day. So I think that internally we are quite ready to uh, actually work it out somehow because it's a huge project and we have about eight people only working on it. It should be 50. 
But I think the readiness is there. Please. There's another question. There in the... Okay. Just a moment. Please. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the story. Uh, if you read the news in Latvia and also Twitter, you, you hear a lot about Estonians doing everything better than we do. Is there one thing besides hockey you think Latvia is doing good as well, or even better than Estonia? Well, I, um, well some, uh, some think that this is just that the one thing that we do better, this is PR. <laughs> and all the other things are either equal or we should judge them. But uh, I, I don't understand really what uh, we are doing better. Uh, besides one thing, I think we are really persistent with messages. And in everything else, I see great things happening all over the Baltics. But take Lithuania, for example. Uh, Estonia has this kind of future-related focus because of the IT. Lithuania has tried to reach a brand of itself in many ways, like I don't know how many times, and they change it in every, like, now and then, because people are not happy with this, and a new guy comes, and uh, there is a new solution. And I think we've always had this information technology, information technology, all the time, like 20 years. And this kind of modernity image this, uh, has only now started to uh, gain traction. So I guess that we're all doing pretty similar things, but we are just doing one thing consistently. I think there is a question there. Yeah, I also have one question. I'm very curious about e-residency project and do you also somehow measure the values of those people who are, would like to pretend on this e-residency? If mm -hmm. not, why it's not important? Well, uh, do, do we actually uh, look at these people who apply? Yeah, some it's, face control or well, values yeah. control test or... <laughs> there is definitely a face control. And uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, on uh, legal uh, issues and uh, on this kind of... Um, uh, like, like, if you had this kind of visa system, you would also have some kind of public control. And uh, if you are denied a visa, you sometimes even are not provided with a reason. So I guess with e-residency it might be quite similar that uh, we have a Minister of Internal Affairs who are actually looking into every application and also it is important that what are the reasons you actually want to apply this. Most logical reason might actually be business or something like that. So uh, there is definitely a lot of, um, a lot of uh, interaction with the government before you get it and we are trying to make it as smooth as possible. And at the same time, uh, the word e-residency actually sends out uh, many mixed messages. For example, I was talking to people, again, with 11 people I was talking to on venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, and uh, he had actually this idea that Estonia now is the first open country in the world, that basically everyone can flock in and, and it's like, do whatever you want. And when I told him that, no, it's, we are actually in very early stage, you can actually only use these and these services, and he said, ah, oh, okay, never mind. Uh, I don't care if it's only a few services. It's, it's just such a cool idea. <laughs> so with this kind of e-residency, you have uh, immediately this kind of ideas that, uh, okay, we are 10,000 people in China. Can we relocate tomorrow? No, <laughs> you cannot, unfortunately. But uh, there have been uh, requests like that too. I, I see more questions. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you can I, I think we take one from the back. Where I don't know. The mic now has to travel a lot. But yes. Uh, wait, wait, wait for the microphone. Um, thank you for your presentation. I really liked your story about uh, that you are making identity of on something that is always a little bit broken. And uh, I saw that the problem here is that we always want to be perfect, and if yeah. it's not perfect, then we are blaming ourselves. So I wanted to ask if uh, this, uh, this idea to build on something that is always a little bit broken, does it take a courage uh, for mm -hmm. you to admit the mistakes, or does it take mentality of the audience to accept that sometimes there might be problems, or there might be problems always? Uh, there good, is some good question. I think it has to start from uh, your own willingness to accept that it is broken. And uh, my uh, 
And as any communications person probably knows, that the audience would be much more okay to accept these things if you openly say. And so that's basically the key question. That are the leaders actually establishing the right promises? And uh, already by establishing the service, already say that, listen, this is information technology. Things happen, but we do it for this reason. And uh, then uh, also invite this kind of people to test it and be ready to criticize. That's another way. But you actually, uh, in Estonia, we are planning this kind of conference of skeptics of e-governments governance in order to actually bring in this kind of thing, bring in the attack or bring in the criticism, because this is a natural thing to do. These are your allies. If you want to discover what is broken and how to improve it, you have actually to include the skeptics too. And that's about the third thing that governments naturally don't do so much. And so that is why I don't say that we're very good at this in Estonia. I'm just saying that this is the plan we should actually have. And sometimes we're good with this, and sometimes we are not so good with this. Thanks. There's a question here. Yeah. I, um, let me start by your presentation was really, really nice. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your presentation. My name is C uh, Gabby Kuhl. I'm the CEO of, of PINS. And I had the privilege to see your Prime Minister last year at the Slush Conference, where he was co-presenting with the Prime Minister of Finland. And so you found a very kind of nice, kind of also young, fresh face to deliver this kind of message. My question is now that governments come and go. So how do you basically, you mentioned Scandinavia, seven years basically delivering this message. So how do you embed this kind of, in your society, your message that it's not depending on the flavor of the election mm -hmm. outcome, mm -hmm. that you can really deliver this, this over time. And the other thing that I thought was also interesting, I, I saw your, your list on e-government and all the achievements. I also think that you've leveraged Skype very well as kind of a, yeah. as, as kind of a, a proven that's a, point for you. And I, yeah. I think that's maybe also here for, for Latvia, we would really like to see mm -hmm. what kind of export companies can we create here that the, mm -hmm. that society feels like they can embrace and, and be, be proud of. But, Maybe yeah. first back to the I, I think that uh, this is a perfect two question because I can start with the last one uh, because it also answers the first one. Skype was invented by Estonian guys and also with the help of uh, Nordic uh, Scandinavian investors. Uh, I didn't have so much time to talk about this, but basically if you go to Texas, for example, and there is no one who knows Estonia in an elevator and you have like one sentence, you say Estonia is the place where Skype was invented period. It works. So we have this one great example that really works. And in Estonia, we are already forgetting about this. And we're thinking, OK, Skype, it was bought by Microsoft and so what. But basically, it still works. And we are not using it as much as possible, as much as we should. But uh, well, from the other hand, we probably don't want to be hostage of one brand or of one company like Finland, the Nokia. Sometimes if you are a hostage, it actually can backfire at some point when the company doesn't do very well. But basically, I think that Skype also did was that the, the fact that we had so much to do with this inspired a lot in Estonia. I think that there are like uh, tens of hundreds or I don't know, thousands of young people who have started uh, enterprises because of a Skype example. And I think politically, you can't really uh, agree across like 100 years on some things. But if there is this kind of inspiration present, uh, then uh, it becomes more natural to politicians as well. So we come back again to this dichotomy of uh, having a real thing and having communication. If you have no real things, then the next coalition would probably change direction. But if we have real achievements, if we have real resonance in the world, I think it makes sense to them to make more of it. And of course, there, has to be some, there have to be some people who actually take the old strategy and renew it and renew it. And uh, we have another experience with Brand Estonia, which we actually have not changed for years. And now there will be a refresh. But basically, the, the, the beauty of it was that even though it wasn't really maybe total genius, because our slogan is welcome to Estonia, <laughs> but we still have it. <laughs> and, uh, and it's not about the slogan, but it's, it's about all the ecosystem around the brand. And uh, since we had it, like also from 2003, uh, 
it made everyone actually do the same things, basically, because it was in a brand book. And uh, I, I guess that uh, to have this kind of uh, coalition around uh, building this brand is important because Welcome to Estonia was actually introduced so that uh, there were 300 advertising people and PR people who actually were asked to put in their ideas and then all kind of this kind of engaging thing was done. So if you do something like just like that, and I'm not asking anyone to join me in, then probably it will be changed also next year. So maybe with two or three tips, and have an example and uh, do engagement and, and things like that. So I guess we thank you very much for your thank presentation. You. That's <laughs> very, very nice.